Welcome to the Zanbergen Report, where wealth strategies and pop culture collide, featuring your distinguished host and certified financial planner, Bart Zandbergen. Welcome to our show of dream chasers and wealth makers. We are thrilled to be back in the studio today with a new episode of the Zanbergen Report. I'm proud to bring in the movers, shakers, and difference makers who are passionate about sharing what they have learned and what you need to know today. And today I'm very excited to have in studio the attorneys of Divorce Mediation of California. Ladies, welcome to the show. Thanks Thank for you. having us. Thanks, Bart. Sure. And since there are three of you, I'm going to allow you to each introduce yourself and just a little background on each other. So, or yourselves rather. Uh, Lisa, you want to start? Sure. Um, I'm Lisa Reisner. I am an attorney, as you said. I've been litigating for 25 years and mediating for about 17 years. So we are um, shrinking down what we're doing with the litigation practice, and we're shifting over to just doing mediation going forward. Okay, great. We're going to drill down on that, but Paris? Yeah, hi. My name is Paris Trimble. I've been practicing, I think, 10, 11 years, 12 years, and mediating probably maybe only about six. Um, Done a lot of litigation really like mediation, feel I'm helping people in mediation, much more so than litigation, and I like that. Um, Okay. Suzanne? Hi, Bart. My name's Suzanne Gregory, and I am an attorney with Divorce Mediation of California. I've been practicing for 26 years now, and uh, the entire time as a family law attorney and mediator most recently. I've actually been working with Lisa going back to 1998, so uh, we have a good we were uh-huh. team. Yeah, yeah, of course you were. <laughs> That's right. I know you were. <laughs> okay, great. So your entire legal careers have been in family law, yes? Well, I started off in criminal defense and then quickly shifted over to family yeah. law. Okay. What, what um, and I say this with, with much love, what <laughs> possesses someone to go down the path of family law? I have an interesting way that I ended up because when I was in uh, go- undergrad, I said, I will never, ever do family law. <laughs> yes. And uh, here we are. Uh, I ended up in law school and I volunteered at the Student Legal Center on campus. And we had a variety of issues, landlord tenant, you know, DUI, all sorts of things. And I helped one person with a divorce, a graduate student. And I just felt that I really connected and was able to help someone. And I thought, well, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. So I started, yeah, volunteering and doing things like that. And here we are. It's funny how that happens, right? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) How about you, Paris? Yeah, that's a good question. I did a little bit of criminal defense when I got out. um, And then I did a little bit of civil, um, which I liked. I liked the experience. Um, Something always drew me to family. I feel like you're almost like part, I don't want to say therapist because I have no credentials in that, but... You're more of just an attorney. You're kind of an ear. Yeah. And I've, I kind of have that kind of nurturing, mothering. That's just part of my nature and who I am. And so I identify and want to help those clients. So I think that's why I'm here. Yeah. And Lisa, and during my um, CDF uh, training, I learned that, and maybe you can uh, um, elaborate on it, that the the books, the, the court system of family law is completely separate from uh, the traditional court system. Is, is that correct? <clears throat> That's correct. They do have their own courts. Um, some of the code sections do carry over from other areas of law, like the Code of Civil Procedure, uh, Evidence Code, obviously. Um, but Family Code does have its own California Family Code. It yeah. is its own animal, yes. So interesting. Yeah. Interesting. So let's – so there's divorce, there's mediation, there's collaborative. Correct. Um, let's talk about – the differences, why one would do one over the other, maybe some advantages. Mm-hmm. I'll let you get started and we'll, we'll drill down. Sure. In California, there's currently three ways you can get a divorce. Uh, the traditional way, which a lot of people refer to as litigation, that's where two parties go through the court system. You may or may not have attorneys. Um, a lot of people do not. They cannot afford it. But the courts encourage you to what they call meet and confer and settle what you can. And then what you cannot agree to, the the court will have a trial. And in family court, it's not a trial by jury. It is a a judicial officer, judge, that makes the orders. So each side will present their positions at the trial. 
The judge makes a call, and then those orders are memorialized into a judgment. That's how a family law case ends. So in uh, the other two ways to get a divorce, they're voluntary. There's mediation and there's collaborative. And those are in the category of ADR, alternative dispute resolution. So what does that mean? It means that it takes both sides to voluntarily agree to place it into ADR. You could get a divorce from someone in California, um, whether they like it or not. Uh, You could drag them through this system, kicking and screaming, or they could choose not to participate and you could default through the court system. It does not require the other person's consent to get a divorce in the traditional sense. But if you want to do mediation or collaborative, both both sides sign a contract that actually change the, the process into one of those two ways. In, in the ADRs, would it, is it fair to say that not only that both need to agree, but both need to have some semblance of reasonableness? <clears throat> well, that would be the hope, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody likes the benefits of ADR because it is way less expensive and it is very peaceful and the timing is very quick. Um, the average time to get a case from beginning to end in court right now is sometimes years, not months, because yeah. they were already, you know, had a backlog before COVID and then right. COVID just wreaked havoc and the court was actually shut down for a few months. So the backlog is was pretty bad. So everybody likes the fact that, oh, we can get it done quickly. We can save a lot of money, but not everyone is a candidate for mediation. You have to come to the table with a mindset of, okay, we're going to compromise and we're going to come to an agreement. Right, right. So let's let's drill down on um, each of the two ADRs and maybe what the differences are, advantages, disadvantages, and maybe, right. um, I mean, what I have seen that people, to your point, kind of have the intent and they may start in this direction and then it blows up. Mm-hmm. So what causes that? Right. So the, the way they're the same is they're out of court. You replace the judge. The cl- this is a client-driven process where the parties come together, and by reaching an agreement, you are replacing the judge's role of making an order. So they're similar in that regard. In mediation, there is one neutral mediator. That person does not represent anybody. They're a peacemaker in between trying to facilitate helping the parties reach an agreement. So what can a mediator do? Uh, you, they can tell the parties what the law is. They can tell them um, how a court would approach uh, a disputed issue, and they can help them come up with settlement options that they may know may not know are possible because they don't do this every day. But they cannot give advice to one side or the other. They have to stay completely neutral and transparent. In collaborative, it's the the similarities stop after it's out of court. You sign a contract saying we're not going to go to court. We're going to resolve this ourselves. In collaborative, you assemble a team. You have your own lawyer that represents just you. You have your own mental health professional that is a divorce coach. It's not therapy. It's someone who is trained to get you through the um, divorce process. And then there's add-ons. There could be a neutral financial specialist and a neutral child specialist. And then you work as a team to come up with a judgment. So each of those players um, represents both. It's not one for each side. There is one for each side on the attorney and the mental health professional. But the okay. but the financial person is neutral. The child specialist is neutral. Okay. Okay. Um, and then, so maybe from that point forward on both, let's just walk through a case. Sure. <clears throat> if, if someone wants to um, handle their case through the collaborative process, you know, you sign the contract, and then there's usually one of the mental health professionals that's kind of the the guide, the one that coordinates everybody's schedules and assembles team meetings and keeps, you know, kind of coordinates, you know, are we ready to have a meeting? Um, Is, does the financial person have all the information they need? And it's all very informal. So that's why the cost is less than litigation because you're not sending out formal discovery. It's, Hey, I need to see your latest retirement statement. Okay. Let me send it over to you. It's very transparent and cooperative. Okay. So, there, obviously, there's <clears throat> excuse me, still attorney and attorney's fees, but yes. theoretically, the amount of hours would be less. 
it, that's what it tends to be. Yeah. Litigation tends to be the most expensive, as most people know. Uh, collaborative is in the middle. <laughs> and then mediation is usually the least expensive. Okay. Yeah. All right. And then, um, all right, so on the mediation side, so it's just, and that's, you guys serve as mediators, correct? Correct. Right. Okay. So you're in a room. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You have one on each side of you. Yes. And then your refereeing. Yeah, sometimes you want to wear a helmet <laughs> and get combat paint. No, no, because we we try really hard to prep them for what to expect. You know, yeah. if you if 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 it's high conflict, maybe they're not good candidates for it. You don't want to set people up for frustration. Right. So that we offer a free initial consultation, and that's what we're doing. We're kind of vetting out. It's like, okay, they came together. That's a good sign. Yeah. How how what's the body language? How are they talking to each other? Yeah. Um, and so you know. There's going to be those that will surprise you, but and it is divorce. It is, you know, it is a touchy yeah. uh, area. But um, we go. We've uh, been to the training through Pepperdine um, Strauss Institute, and they give you lots of tools on what to do um, when things heat up because it's it's a <laughs> emotional thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it does get that way. But we we sometimes remind them you've chosen this. Right. You came here for a reason. So sometimes you just need that little reminder that you're here because you want to reach a peaceful agreement between the two of you, yeah. especially moving forward when you have children. And and Lisa always said, tells them, we leave our swords outside the door, period. So sometimes right. they need a little reminder, but it, it's good that they have made this conscious choice to be there. Right. So that's helpful. You actually bring up a great point. So uh, in the mediation method, and there is children and child custody and that whole thing. So you as mediators, is it still the, is it the DISO master for child support or for, okay. Yes. So do you run that? And then do you say, like, this isn't my decision. This is what the system says. Is that? Yeah. The, the, one of the really great things about mediation is you can get creative and you, as you know, as long as it's within the, um, to comply with the the rules of how a judgment needs to be formatted, you can get pretty creative on your court orders and tailor it to what works best for your family. So we do um, show them the DISO Master for Child Support, and sometimes they say, yeah, let's go with that, or sometimes they say, well, that doesn't really make sense. Uh, let's do something else. So it's great when you see them working together yeah. and come up with their own thing that works better for them. So that's actually a good lead-in. So our – You've gone through the process, both sides are in agreement, and then what? So it just still has to get a stamp of approval from, right. from the family judge. judge. Okay. Right. So we write it up in the format that they require. We email it to them. We encourage them again to go get um, their own advice from their own respective attorney because we remind them we're neutral. We don't represent you. Yeah. We don't have any judicial authority. Um you should probably go have this uh, looked at before you sign it. It's a pretty grown-up document. And yeah. so after everybody says, yes, this is the version we're going to sign, then we go process it at the court for them because the goal is we don't want them to ever step foot in the courthouse. Right. So is it common then that um, both parties or one of the parties in the mediation will have an attorney as well but that are just not in the sessions but for, for – um, <clears throat> Right. Some people have what they call consulting attorneys, and we act as that for other mediations um, where we're just in the background. That's a lot less expensive and a lot different than being the, quote, attorney of record through mm. the whole process. You're just as needed, um, available to that person to help them maybe with some documents or just questions about the law and the process and help them come up with some negotiation ideas. Um, so... We encourage that. It's always better if they have their own attorney. You don't have to, but it's, yeah. it's, it's advised. Okay. And then the judge looks at it and makes sure that nothing's egregious, like, hey, this looks like it really a leaning on one no, side. Or, they're, or no, they're not. Don't even look. <laughs> they're going to be <laughs> like, cool, one less thing off our case list. Yeah, yeah. Um, th they're not going to nitpick the agreement. Yeah. They're there more for format and to make sure the specific language that's required in every judgment is there, yeah. but not the terms. If one party is benefiting more than the other, nope, they figure if you entered into that agreement, we're yeah. good. We'll sign off as long okay. as it's not, you know, against public policy. All right. So we all live here in Orange County. So prenup, how, mm. how does that play in any of these three and how, how strong are they? Do you, do you comments on that? 
Yeah, we actually dra- we do draft prenups as well. <laughs> so that's we, we do that out of our office. Um, we had an interesting case. Suzanne and I were meeting a case about um, two or three months ago, and they came in. Parties came in, and interestingly, they had had a prenup. Um, but they came to the table together and they decided they did not want to follow the prenup. And the prenup had a pretty strong clause where it was terminating spousal support. And they were saying, I know that's what the prenup says, but the one party was willing to still pay fairly sizable spousal support chunk. So uh, you just have to remember when you're coming to the mediation table, you're coming, it's, you know, you're coming to reach an agreement. He felt it was in the best interest of the kids. He's like, fine, I'm just going to pay your spousal. Now, if that case were to go to litigation, the likelihood of that, right, is probably the courts would first, and you can, in court, if the, this were litigated, the court sometimes bifurcates the issue of the prenup. So they take that issue apart, and they have a separate trial on the validity. If one side saying, no, this prenup isn't valid, the court will hear that first, because how this court's going to rule on that, everything else is going to fall into place. They, they would have an issue of someone not, how am I going to say this, doing more than the prenup as, as opposed to less? Is that, did I hear? No, I don't think so. Not in litigation. <clears throat> oh, okay, okay. I, I just, yeah. all right, I misunderstood. Yeah. Not, if, not, to, not to bash on our fellow attorney brethren, but yeah. if you're in litigation, I've been a litigator, and you're like, yeah. I, you know, you hired me to get you the best outcome you can. Yeah. If you have a prenup that says you're not going to pay or anything, if you want to voluntarily do something, that's great and generous, but let's let's make sure it is voluntary and not a court order. That kind of thing goes on in litigation. Uh, okay. So it might go down a different path. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so one attorney told me once many, many years ago <laughs> that um, – uh, so I went through a divorce about 20 years ago. Someone at this table helped me. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember saying, this just isn't fair. And it was you and Tina. You looked at me in the eye and said, fair is a four-letter word that starts with an F. Don't ever say that in this family. <laughs> <laughs> that has stuck with me. For, <laughs> I, I, I use it with my kids when they say, it. that's not fair. And I say, that's a four-letter word. <laughs> It's also something that happens in Pomona once a year. <laughs> <The fair. Yeah. laughs> That's funny. Um, what do you see in this um, new cases come in? What are you are you guys litigating at all, or is that not even on your plate? We still are. We're shrinking it down. We're not taking a lot of new ones right okay. now because we are shifting um, all of our energy into building up um, right. this mediation practice. Okay. So if we take litigation out, what percentage do you have? I'm sorry. Yeah, taking litigation out, what percentage are you seeing mediation versus collaborative? Um, You know, I haven't done a collaborative case in several years. Um, I did the training, and I did them. uh, When when it first came to Orange County, this would have been about 2003, 2004. Um, But it just did not take off in Orange County like it did up in, you know, Northern California or even San Diego. It started in uh, Minnesota. Um, The the, the brainchild um, started it there. And it even took off in other countries. But for some reason, it has not been that popular in collaborative. Interesting. In Orange County to do collaborative. Okay. So it's... Litigate or mediate. Yeah. I mean, if somebody approached me and said, will you be my collaborative attorney, I would absolutely help them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it seems like there's clearly some advantages. There is. That. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. You find, though, that a lot of that can also be handled through mediation because we do employ the services of a divorce coach sometimes if we think the two yeah. parties in mediation need it or if they need a financial um, a forensic accountant. They can employ the services. So right. it's more an a la carte, who do we need for this particular case in mediation? So right. it's it's similar in that way that you can still use those professionals, yeah. but it's they're not always needed. Right. Well, in the case that we did, that was a mediation, right, where I was your yes. CD, your financial yes. guy. Yeah. 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 yeah, that was a very high asset case that you yeah. came in and helped. You, you and uh, Letitia were awesome helping them understand right. and we're not dividing apples and apples. We're dividing apples and oranges and let's look at the balance sheet. Yeah. And that's probably worth um, diving in, into a little bit. I mean, asset A is not always equal to asset B, asset C. Right. If you take a retirement account versus a brokerage account versus a house, right. you know, three, you know, 
let's say they're all, let's just make it easy. Let's say they're all 500 grand. Well, as we all know on this table, 500 grand in a retirement account is not equal to 500 grand in a brokerage, nor 500 in equity in a house, right? Right. There's taxes and other implications. The other great thing about mediation is we have you really look at, well, why do you want what you want? Because some people will say, I got to get the house. That's, <laughs> I put my heart into that house. I built that add-on. I brought my babies home there. I put, you know, my heart into it. I just, I have to have that house. It's like, okay, let's, let's talk about it. Let's walk down the path of if that's what you decide, how much are you going to have to borrow, you know, mortgage in just your name? And then what's your monthly nut going to now look like? Are you going to be house rich, but cash poor? Right. So you're eating top ramen and you can't get your nails done, but you got your house. Is it right. worth it? Mm -hmm. And so um, in litigation, uh, the courts don't have the ability or the time to do that. Um, anybody can divide everything in half and run a calculator and send you on your way. But we want you to look at, okay, how is this process when I'm done? How's it going to impact my retirement goals? Right. I have had so many you know, friends, clients, because people, you know, look, we live in Orange County. What's the ratio? 50% of successful. Yeah. Second time marriage, it's higher. Yeah. Higher divorce rate. Yes. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, and often it, and to your earlier point about being kind of part therapist, um, you know, again, I'm not an attorney, but people come to me for suggestions or advice and often like this, you know, out of principle, the, you know, the house is mine um, for whatever reason, maybe the reasons you said. And if you really take a step back, is it is it really that important, and especially financially? Like you could have the house or you could have, you know, this account worth hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars. Let's, let's be reasonable. Right. And the other advice I, I normally give, uh, and it's usually to the the financial spouse. So there, as we all know, there's a financial, normally, mm -hmm. not always normally, mm -hmm. there's a financial and a non-financial. So the financial spouse, the one that's normally going to get tapped for support and, and the one that's worked hard and, mm -hmm. you know, there's the principle there. I remember going through that with you and like, no, I'm not going to do that. Yeah. And what I learned from our experience together is most likely whatever they're asking for, just do it. Just give it. Well, within reason, within reason. Part. <laughs> I would have, you know, in no, my case, I would, well, yeah, you, they're, yeah, they don't want to be a total pushover, but in, and I, I relive this all the time. If I would have just given exactly what was wanted up front, it was better than what we ended up negotiating at the end. And no fault of anybody, my mm -hmm. fault for well, being. A good litigator needs to give you the the projected cost of yeah. taking something to the mat because yeah. is it worth it? You know, and it's a gamble. You Time, never know. Time, energy, the stress. energy and the yeah. stresses. And that's what I say too. Look, just get it over with. And, and, now, and again, well, as fast as you can, whatever it is to get done as fast as you can, because right. the wheels are always churning. Mm -hmm. The clocks are ticking, the time, your energy of like what the space in your, the bandwidth in your brain and in your emotion and, yeah. Yeah. But sometimes you have an opposing party that, you know, your back's against the wall. You yes, that's true. You know, I had a case where I represented a dad, um, no history of any, you know, mental health issues, no history of drug or alcohol, just mom said, no, no, you can see him when I say you see him. Well, you know, you've just put us in a position where we have nothing to lose, yeah, right? right? But if the other side is like, hey, this is kind of what I'm thinking and it's within the realm of reasonable then yeah, it would be wise to weigh out, all right, maybe I don't, I don't like it 100%, but yeah. what's it going to cost me to go roll the dice with a stranger in a robe and see what he or she's going to say? <laughs> yeah, that's right. right. That's right. Um, you know what the audience really loves is like case studies and real life examples. And I, I know I didn't prep you all, but maybe you have a um, <laughs> oh. like a real juicy one. <laughs> oh. Name No names, of course, but okay. a good one. I don't know who's listening. So. <laughs> <laughs> no names. I get asked this all the time. I think I would have a really juicy one just like ready to girls. Well, I'm uh, not sure I want to admit this, but my favorite stories always revolve around sex. Uh, All right, then. I'm, All right. <laughs> I'm not sure what it is. Maybe it's because I handle a lot of the behind-the-scenes settlement work. But I often have conversations about uh, interesting sexual encounters with my clients. Uh, no, not with my clients. Sorry, that came out wrong. Uh, 
about my clients, <laughs> uh, about their sexual activities. Anyway, I don't know what it is about my face. It's my psychology minor. I don't know. But I hear all the stories. So we, we, have, we have one client who had a suspicion that maybe his wife had engaged in some uh, extramarital activity. We said, well, all right, well, this happened allegedly out of state. Okay. An out of state um, company, place, location doesn't have to honor a California subpoena, but we'll try. Let's see what we can do. Yeah. And uh, thankfully, they did comply. And boy, do you find out a lot when you uh, subpoena someone's credit card statements, their bank records, and you find out who, where, when, who, where, when, and how. <laughs> <laughs> So that one ended up in, in did end up in court. Lisa, you want to take it yeah. from the court aspect? Yeah, I, I want to start by saying it's a no fault state I was in California. Say, it doesn't even matter. It, does if it? you cheat, it doesn't matter. Except yeah. if you're spending community funds to pay for these uh, extracurricular uh, activities, which is it, it was substantial. When uh, uh, what was very interesting is when we uh, subpoenaed the records of a specific hotel where this was going on, and the detail on the invoicing for the hotel bill included intimacy kits, things like that. So that, and I had an opposing counsel that did not object to the records coming into evidence. I got it all in and it did sway the court. And yeah. so our client was uh, reimbursed in the balance sheet for those kind of expenses. Okay, so it's 50-50 and then, okay, here's whatever, right. thousands the, of dollars. Those dollars did not benefit the community. No. <laughs> <laughs> and when you saw the titles of some of the things that they uh, purchased while they were in said hotel, yeah. it definitely did not benefit the community. <laughs> Okay. All right. Now I see why y'all got in family law. That's <laughs> <laughs> the real reason. It's never a dull day. Never a dull day. Um, let's drill down a little bit on the f kind of the finance, maybe a little bit more. So like we said, there's typically, the f typically sometimes they're both financial, financial spouses, but typically there's the one that, that is the one responsible for paying support, the one that's responsible for um, paying the bills, et cetera, and, and others, you know, not unfortunately, they're just, they're in a marriage, they're in a partnership, and they have certain duties. The other one has other duties. And I've seen it both ways. I have male non-financial clients that were stayed home, took care, and has paid support by the wife, and then vice versa. Um, it, what, tell me what, you, what you're doing there. Yeah, that's one of the biggest um, embarrassments that clients will have, and we try to squelch that right from the beginning. Say, look, when you're in a relationship, it's very common to delegate tasks. Maybe it's your job to get kids to school, get them to the doctor. Maybe this parent, you know, they're they're more, you know, um, skilled in that area of handling and the investments and things like that. So it's not uncommon to say, I didn't even know we had stocks, or I didn't even know they had this. Um, so if if you don't know, that's Part of the process, uh, finding out what is there. And the um, state of California requires everyone to sign under penalty of perjury disclosure documents saying, here's what I have, you have, and we have for that purpose. Um, so it's a good opportunity when a client is coming through the divorce, coming to the end. Now they're getting their half or their portion. We can guide them to somebody like you to say, okay, now it's time to get educated and right. be responsible with what you now are in charge of. Right. I I'm cur currently have a new client that we're in the process of, of onboarding, actually, that um, received a s settlement from the divorce. Uh, and after the split, she got part of the brokerage account and the assets that were in her account. But we're currently in a time where their stock market is not doing so great. It's he took care of everything. He managed it. It was all in stocks. So what she showed me is about 40% less than what she thought she was getting. And then the second issue is from a tax perspective, she had no idea. She said, like, at, at one point this was worth a lot more money. It's worth less now. I, she, she has said to me, I, I, I don't like this kind of risk. I want to reduce my risk. However, I don't know what the cost basis is. So that's the other thing, right, in a brokerage account because – if you paid $100 for something and now it's worth 1000 and we sell it to reposition and then she's going to be responsible for the taxes. So there's a lot of a lot of moving parts. Right. <clears throat> and it could um, impact a lot of dollars. It could yeah. it could mean getting substantially more or less. Right. Yeah. Right. How 
do people reach you? Website? Yeah, we have a website. website. <laughs> <laughs> we have one of those. Uh, our website. It's not a trick question. No. Trust me. <laughs> uh, we're attorneys, you know. We're <laughs> objection. <Yeah. laughs> uh, DivorceMediationCA.com. The CA obviously stands for California. So DivorceMediationCA.com. Telephone number, they can call us. A lot of people prefer that. Um, so you can do it online, and uh, our telephone number is 949-333-9412. Great. Those are two excellent contacts. <laughs> and, and when you contact our office, you speak with one of the three of us. Oh. No, yes. no matter who it is, one of us picks up the phone. Yeah. So you're directly speaking with an attorney when you call. Yeah. We'll set that something up for you, but knowing that they can sometimes ask a few things to know if they if a consultation is a good idea. I know the people who are going to ask for you now, Suzanne. Oh, <laughs> so gosh. Sure. I've exposed myself. <laughs> you are. You're going to be that Literally. <laughs> um, anything you all want to say in closing? Yeah, I just want to say that um, the way we handle our cases is we all work on every case as a team. Um, one of the biggest complaints of clients is I couldn't get anybody to call me back or my attorneys in court or whatever. So we meet frequently at least once a week and go over every case. We have notes in the computer as to where the status is. So sometimes that 20 second phone call can just reduce stress, yeah, you know. Right. Um, so we, we try really hard to make ourselves accessible and answer questions. So if somebody's on vacation or out for the day, the other two can pick up and, and answer the question. Does that mean, so if someone says, okay, I'm going to mediation, they are not hiring Lisa or Paris or Susanna, they're hiring the firm and then you all work, we work um, together. seamlessly? Correct. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. We work together and what we've seen lately is that uh, it's been really beneficial where we normally now conduct the mediation sessions with at least two of us there. Mm -hmm. Just We all have our different styles. Right. And uh, Lisa used to handle a lot, or Paris would do on their own, but we found recently that having two of us there really is beneficial for the clients. Mm -hmm. That's great. So my f final closing question, I'm going to throw this out to the group. You can all answer. One of you can take it and run with it. Okay. What is your ultimate lesson learned in your time as divorce sp attorneys, specialists, mediators? Mm. Oh, mine's easy. Okay. Uh, Keep your clothes on. No. <laughs> <laughs> Keep Don't it let in your the pants. other person find out. Yeah. <laughs> I think I've just been much more appreciative of my husband. Uh, we met yeah. in, law, in law school. We're still yeah. married. He's an attorney, obviously, as well. Yeah. But I think that when you go through life, you, you, you just tend to forget things. Well, it's in my face every day <laughs> what, what other people oh, have yeah. done wrong. Yeah. And I think that you can take a lot of, I've taken a lot of those lessons and learned, whether it's, you know, emotional or financial or anything like that, yeah. that you're able to say, you know what, I don't want to end up down that road yeah. and I'm going to use these lessons in my own life. Good one. That's good. good. One. Anybody going to yeah, top that? I, uh, no, <laughs> but uh, I'll say my, what I've learned, my closing line on my email, and it's so cheesy and it drives everyone nuts, but it says, what is my closing line on? It says, be kinder than necessary for everyone you meet is fighting some sort of battle. And I think I've learned that in practicing law because we're taught to be such zealous advocates and be so aggressive. And sometimes, and that's why I love mediation, you just try to sit down and help these people reach a resolution, stop the fighting, help people out. Life's tough enough. Right. You know, you don't need to go battle it out for five, six, seven, eight years in the courtroom. Right. So. Good ones. I would say my biggest lesson I've learned is when, like Suzanne said, we see all the causes of why things fall apart, right? People survive financial hits. They survive affairs. But I think the erosion of respect is what causes most people to... Um, that divide and not find their way back. Because once you cross that line, and it doesn't happen overnight, you don't come home from your honeymoon and start calling your wife the B word. But it's just slowly over time, you take that person for granted and you just don't show that respect. Um, sometimes you can get back across the line, but a lot of times you can't. Yeah. So that's the person that you chose to be your you know, partner in life. Right. Treat them like better than anybody else. Yeah. That was great, ladies. Thank you very much. Thanks for your time, your insight, wisdom. 
Susanna. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. The spice. <laughs> That's fine. All right, guys. Thanks Thank a lot. You, Bart. Thanks, Thank you, Bart. Thank you. Thank you for all who have tuned in. We look forward to being in the studio next week. Cheers. Tune in next week for the latest edition of the Zanbergen Report, Tuesdays at 2 p.m. Catch up on our recent shows by visiting podcast.bartzanbergen.com. The Zanbergen Report is also available on iTunes, iHeartRadio, and Spotify. Interested in being a featured guest on our show or have a question you'd like to hear us answer? Email podcast at bartzanbergen.com. The contents of this podcast episode do not constitute an offer of securities or a solicitation of an offer to buy securities and may not be relied upon in making an investment decision related to any investment offering Access Wealth Management LLC, an SEC-registered investment advisor. Access does not warrant the accuracy or completeness of the information contained herein. Opinions are our current opinions and are subject to change without notice. Prices, quotes, rates are subject to change without notice. Generally, investments are not FDIC insured, not bank guaranteed and may lose value.